Today we find the federal government involved in professions, telling doctors how to doctor, and telling teachers how to teach, and as one wag said, they're telling carpenters how to carp. But we have seen the tremendous growth in government in the 20th century, an explosive growth far beyond the boundaries imposed by our Constitution. Today there's hardly a single area of activity in this country or indeed around the world where the United States federal government is not involved. This has produced, of course, an explosive growth in the cost of government. Politicians are reluctant to raise the taxes directly to pay for that explosive growth. <clears throat> this means deficits, and out of the deficits we have a growing national debt, where today just servicing that debt has become the third largest item in the federal budget. And to further service the debt and the creation of new money, we have had the development of a central banking apparatus, in this case the Federal Reserve System. Now, our founding fathers had a great argument over this point of the question of a central bank, and there's been argument down through uh, the decades on this point. But one thing that is very clear with the development of this, it has become the engine of inflation. Thomas Jefferson, in warning about the question of a federal debt, had this to say. I place economy among the first and most important virtues, and public debt as the greatest of dangers to be feared. To preserve our independence, we must make our election between economy and liberty, or profusion and serv servitude. If we run into such debts, we must be taxed in our meat and drinks, in our necessities and comforts, in our labors and our amusements. If we can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of caring for them, they must become happy. I think the emphasis on that has to be that last sentence, that if we can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of caring for them, they must become happy. Now with this explosive growth of new money, that means, of course, inflation. And I know that many people are being led to believe that politicians in Washington during the political season are going to save us from the ravages of inflation. Perhaps if you only remember one thing tonight, I hope you will remember at least this that politicians do not fear inflation. They love it because inflation is the mechanism that allows them to expand the currency, to satisfy, to make up the deficits that allow them to pay for the expanding federal program to satisfy the special interest groups to guarantee their elections. Politicians do not fear inflation. They love it. It is the mechanism for buying votes, in so many cases, to ensure their re-elections. So many people today are, have the attitude that inflation is a problem of rising prices. Indeed, we are led to believe that this is the case. And as long as we lack an understanding of basic issues, we will continue to be plagued with problems like inflation. But saying that inflation is like rising prices is just about as foolish as saying that wet streets cause rain. It's the other way around. Inflation is an increase in the money supply. Who causes inflation? Well, two groups. Counterfeiters can cause inflation when they run off pieces of paper in their basement, printing them up, passing them out in society, because by so doing, they steal from society as a whole. Federal government, to make up the deficits, servicing the deficits, in creating new money, whether by direct printing press or bookkeeping entry or borrowing from the capital markets, also is passing out new money without backing. The principle of immorality remains the same. Counterfeiters, we catch them, we put them in jail. In the case of government, we frequently return the politicians to office, praising them as great humanitarians in their process of expanding the money supply. This tremendous growth in inflation, in government, has brought us the deficits and debt exactly that as feared by Thomas Jefferson and many other of our founding fathers. 
to where today we have the greatest debt in the history of the world, approaching officially one trillion dollars. But you know, when you go to the areas of unfunded liability, you're looking at a debt approaching eight or nine trillion dollars. If you handle the government accounting in the same way that you would handle in the case of a private business or profession, in the area of promises made but money not in the till, you're looking at a massive debt of seven, eight, or nine trillions of dollars. <clears throat> the interest on the debt is today the third largest item, as I mentioned, in the national debt, in our national budget, costing us at a rate of over $2,300 per second, 60 seconds to the minute, 60 minutes to the hour, 24 hours a day, 365 and a quarter days a year. You know, just to cover this, takes about $60,000 in time just to review the massive importance of the cost of the taxpayers just by that third segment of the, of the budget. With the growth of government, we have seen a strangulation of our productive society with agencies such as EPA, OSHA, and many others, that vast alphabet soup in Washington, we're finding that American productivity is grinding down to the level of stagnation. Competing countries such as West Germany, Switzerland, and Japan are expanding their productive capability per person at a rate of 10, 12 percent steadily right along. This has meant that in the competitive world of the world markets, we find that American goods have increasing difficulties. Well, a simple answer that many people propose is the way to solve this, of course, is just simply higher tariffs. But you know, the last time we adopted that philosophy was back during the late 20s, early 30s, and with the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Acts. And most economists will agree that the great worldwide depression was linked to the tariff wars of that period. There wasn't anything very good about the last great worldwide depression, and I certainly don't think that many of us would agree that we need another one today. There's been a basic shift in the philosophy of our society and the philosophy of government away from the concept of the government's function to protect life and property and over to a concept of government being the agent for the redistribution of income. Today, 60% of the federal budget activity of the federal government's activity is that category known as transfer payments. This is where you use the power of government to take money from those who earned it and transfer it over to those who did not. This means that in the process of doing that, we're increasingly penalizing the productive sector and subsidizing the non-productive sector. So that your government's major function today is that of being the leveler of society in the redistribution of income. Now one thing is very clear in reading the writings of our founding fathers, in writing the Constitution and in adding the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments, they did everything they could to make the leveling of society as a function of government unconstitutional. Today that's 60 percent of the federal activity. You know, I speak to a lot of high school and student groups. I frequently ask the students, in philosophical terms, what is the proper function of the federal government? The typical answer is that government today is, should provide me with those things that I feel that I need that I cannot provide for myself. Unfortunately, this is not an atypical answer. This is the traditional or typical answer. This has brought about a tremendous change where more and more people are being led to believe, you know, it's a lot easier to vote yourself a living than it is to work for a living. I think the growing welfare roles reflects the continuing attitude of government's function as a provider rather than a protector. It's too bad Larry McDonald had to die. It's just, um, again, it's just, I guess, what happens when you have somebody that really identifies the problem and he gave that speech in 1976, and look what's happened since then. 
so many things have happened, so many things are different, changed. Um, we're clamping down on society. Well, obviously, you know, he was running for president in uh, 1988. That was his plan. <coughs> and, of course, he died in the uh, Korean air airliner disaster. Shot down by the Soviets. And uh, instead, 1988, uh, Ron Paul ran as a libertarian. Who, of course, uh, Ron Paul actually, his policies uh, mirror Larry's policies. Now, Larry was a brilliant man, literally a genius. Uh, he he graduated medical school, I think, in his early, like 21 or 22. He was like he was out of college when he was like 18, he, 19 years old. He was a, he was one of those uh, brilliant genius types. Uh, he was articulate and uh, knowledgeable, and you know that was bad. It was a threat. It's one thing if you rant and rave and look like a crazy lunatic, but when you start really talking, you know, calmly and logically and, you know, putting these things out in, a, in, a, in, in the way Larry did, um, you get attention. Now, again, he was looked at as a radical. The media demonized him, the whole thing. This radical, radical. He was a Democrat, but his principle sounded more right-wing, but he realized, and they all realized back then, uh, that these party systems are, it's just, he, he, was, he was a Democrat because he had the best opportunity where he was to, to get elected as a Democrat. Uh, the party systems are, are all corrupted, and uh, he knew that. He exposed too much. He was a threat. You know, and the government's been, is notorious for getting rid of these type of threats. So you obviously realize that this is obviously not a real republic. It is not our government. We're under some mind-controlled state uh, that's, you know, that pretends to be uh, free. You know, everything's phony. You know, from the bullshit you watch on TV. I mean, look at all these people's, all their houses, the way they look. And, you know, all the TV shows are about wealthy people and all this wealthy stuff and beautiful homes, million dollar homes. What, what the hell is all this bullshit? Think about it. I mean, you know, I can't even look at television. I don't watch TV. But when I do, I watch it for the analytical purposes of just seeing what's going on in the news coverage. I, you got to watch the news because it's just hilarious. Uh, everybody out there, ladies and gentlemen, awake and sleeping, watch the news because, he, first of all, you get a good laugh. Uh, second, uh, you can understand this manipulation even better. Um, that's, there really is mind control going on, ladies and gentlemen. I talk about this a lot, and a lot of people say, oh, that's why, they, that's why, again, it's a slide response. The CIA calls this slide response. They have programmed you through things like Project Mockingbird and Project Monarch to, like, ridicule and, and to respond a certain way in a slide response to certain issues that they want you to just dismiss as ridiculous. It's intentional. No joke. I speak the truth. This is Truth Talk News, and we are Change on informedradio.com. And you're listening to Howard Nima and watching on uh, livestream.com forward slash Truth Talk News. Uh, during the break, I was contemplating a few things uh, to go over here that I thought were really important. Uh, one of the things was uh, to talk about the Kissinger and the and his whole the way he plays into this whole thing, and he still does. Um, he was then and still is an important agent in the services of the Royal Institute for International Affairs, which is based in London. And he is a member of the Club of Rome and, of course, the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, Rockefeller's arm over here, the British crown on the other side. All right? Now, Kissinger's role in destabilizing the United States by means of three wars, the Middle East, uh, the Korea and Vietnam conflicts, is well known and his role in the Gulf War in which the US Army acted as mercenaries for the Committee of 300 in bringing Kuwait back under control is the same making example of uh, uh, was taken out of control and at the same time was making an example out of Iraq so this is like stuff that's been going on literally for 50 years all of this uh, manipulation uh, 
that's been going on in this area. Today we find the federal government involved in the professions, telling doctors how to doctor, telling teachers how to teach, and as one wag said, they're telling carpenters how to carp. But we have seen the tremendous growth in government in the 20th century, an explosive growth far beyond the boundaries imposed by our Constitution. Today, there's hardly a single area of activity in this country or indeed around the world where the United States Federal, we can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of caring for them. They must become happy. I think the emphasis on that has to be that last sentence, that if we can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of caring for them, they must become happy. Now, with this explosive growth of new money, that means, of course, inflation. And I know that many people are being led to say, I place economy among the first and most important virtues, and public debt as the greatest of dangers to be feared. To preserve our independence, we must make our election between economy and liberty, or profusion and ser servitude. If we run into such debts, we must be taxed in our meat and drinks, in our necessities and comforts, in our labors and our amusements. If new money, we have had the development of a central banking apparatus, in this case the Federal Reserve System. Now, our founding fathers had a great argument over this point of the question of a central bank, and there's been argument down through uh, the decades on this point. But one thing that is very clear with the development of this, it has become the engine of inflation. Thomas Jefferson, in warning about the question of a federal debt, had this to government, is not involved. This has produced, of course, an explosive growth in the cost of government. Politicians are reluctant to raise the taxes directly to pay for that explosive growth. <clears throat> this means deficits. And out of the deficits, we have a growing national debt, where today just servicing that debt has become the third largest item in the federal budget. And to further service the debt and the creation of new